we let it go in real time, I'm just going in and out um, and irrigating. And then I'm going to pump up the eye really high where the pressure is going to be 30. And you can see there's almost like a lavage or you're cleaning out the collector channel system. And this we found is a, is a very good sign, right? But we didn't know that uh, when we first saw this, what we assumed it was. And we, so what we did was we, um, and this is just another thing, this is after a, a dual blade, a hook dual blade goniotomy. You see, just as I'm, I'm just a FACO dual blade, look at the pattern. This is almost like ants marching. Um, uh, this is just, I've, I've, um, I've put in the, uh, I'm, the patient's a fake it right now. I haven't even put in the lens. I'm just inflating it, but I'm inflating the eye and that goes away and I'm reversing flow. Um, really just a kind of a fun video. Um, now I put the lens in the eye and you can see if the pressure in the eye is lower, you can see fluid coming out. I'm going to pump up the eye and I can reverse the flow the opposite way. And you see these clumps of blood going the opposite way. So you, that's an aqueous vein. This is really the best way in vivo to evaluate a patient's collector. And this, you see some fun stuff. You see some very curious things, things that we don't understand yet, but it's just fascinating to see how different patients yeah. have different patterns. Hello, Marina. Yeah. No, it's like okay. I told you okay. yesterday. <laughs> yeah, if there are any questions, please don't hesitate to, to type them in or, uh, or to text or to, 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 uh, to speak up. I want this to be, a, um, a, you know, any questions, any conversation. We're, we're in a different mode. We're in COVID-19 mode. This is relaxed mode and, and, right. and um, take it easy and have some fun. So, uh, so we asked ourselves, what does this quality or the presence of a wave mean anything? Does it, make, does it correlate with outcomes? And so we looked back at our trabectome data, because this was a long time ago, before a lot of this MIG stuff came about. And you know, as you know, trabectome is kind of electrocautery of, um, of the outflow system, of, of the trabecular meshwork. And, um, and we wanted to know whether, um, whether these two patients behaved differently. So patients in, on the left side of the diffuse wave, where you see, you know, before and after, you see this tremendous, tremendous outflow, you know, just blanching. And then here where there's kind of a limited wave where you can see maybe this little vessel went away, this little vessel got diminished. And we wanted to know if these two extremes, if those patients did differently afterwards. So we published this in 2015, five years ago now, um, in the, in the blue journal. And we looked back at 68 eyes of 49 patients. Most of them were phacotrabectomes. And we didn't want to get into kind of percent IOP lowering or anything like that. We just wanted to kind of say, okay, does the degree and the amount of wave mean anything? Mm -hmm. and, and so we kind of, Dr. Feldman and I kind of sat in two different rooms, looked at a bunch of videos and graded everything. And we wanted to know whether, you know, we just made up this, this uh, the staging criteria, which is the wave was, is it one plus, two plus, four, three plus, four plus, and then how many clock hours it, um, it involved. And uh, we really just defined uh, failure as patients that went on to need further surgery. So did they go on to need another tube or a trap? That's how we kind of define failure. And what do we find? So at baseline, the patient's pressures are about 19 on 2.7 meds. This is all the patients preoperatively. And at 12 months, this extensive wave group, their pressures went from 19 down to 13, and on 2.7 meds down to 1.4 meds. So that's pretty, that's pretty good. Most of us would consider that a, a success. Uh, but look at this group over here that had a poor wave. So this poorly defined wave, right? And, um, and they went from having a pressure of 19 to 0.3 to a pressure of 18.4 and a, on meds of 2.7 to 2.9. So we didn't do anything to these patients. This is really kind of that MIGS, that minimally invasive glaucoma surgery versus the minimally effective glaucoma surgery, kind of right, this is the debate right here, right? Uh -huh. And this patient with the extensive wave, this was a minimally invasive successful glaucoma surgery. But in the patients with a minimal wave, this was a minimally effective surgery. They didn't have an intact outflow system. They need a new drain. So Davinder, uh, yep. there's some questions from the audience. 
and a doctor told me, so if you don't see the wave, this surgery don't work at all? Uh, that's a, that's, so that's a very good question. Let me, so I'm getting to that here. So, um, so how many patients went on to need more surgery, right? Because that's how we define failure. So five patients of the 68 eyes went on to need more surgery. Hmm. When you looked at this group over here, this poor wave group, four out of those five eyes were in the poor wave group. So, and there was only 11 patients in that poor wave group. So 36% of patients in this poor wave group needed more surgery, mm -hmm. right? So then this, this is what, this is the most, uh, this is the great question that, that, um, that our colleague asked is, well, what do you do? You're in the operating room, you don't see a wave. At that moment, do you do another surgery? And uh, I have yet, I don't do that yet, unless uh, the patient is a very high surgical risk. Because you can see that 36% of these patients that didn't have a wave went on to need more surgery. But you could flip it around and you can say, well, 64% or two thirds still didn't need another surgery. So there's still a two thirds chance that the patient after one year didn't need another surgery. So what I do is I tell my patients this, you know, before surgery, I have them go to my YouTube channel and watch these videos. And then I tell them right in the recovery room, guess what, sir? I saw the most amazing wave during your surgery. Things went wonderfully. I'm very hopeful that this surgery is going to work. But if they didn't have a good wave, then I tell them right away, right in the recovery room, you know, Mrs. I did not see a wave. Um, the surgery went well, I didn't see a wave. There is about a one third chance that we may have to go back and do another surgery. So that's how I treat this data. And, and I, think, um, I think when we get smarter about classifying, we just made up this classification scale based on what we thought was best. But you know, um, what I would love to do is the next step is you know to maybe even consider doing things like using artificial intelligence and having a bunch of videos or pictures uh -huh. of when there's a maximum wave and there's no wave pre and post op and feeding it into the system and then letting the computer figure out which patients tend to do well and which patients don't so i think this is still a very um elementary or uh an unexact and not specific way of, of looking at this. But I think the smarter we get about understanding the wave, uh -huh. or if we come up with a different way of, of determining intraoperatively, ideally the, 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 the true gift would be to understand this preoperatively in the clinic before you even take the patient to surgery to determine whether the patient has an intact outflow system or not or to understand what subtype of open angle glaucoma they have. Do they have, you know, because primary open angle glaucoma is such a, a, a big bag of a bunch of different types of glaucoma. And in that bag, there are patients that have the problem is in the meshwork. In that bag, there are patients that have the problem downstream. And if we, once we get smarter about subclassifying the patient's type of glaucoma, then we can kind of really start to tailor the surgery to the patient. Um, and so what I'm talking about now is kind of ways that we can kind of guess on which patients will be better with angle surgery and which patients will be worse with angle surgery. So that in, there, in that case, for example, that you have poor uh, weights, uh, you can uh, take advantage that you are in the OR and maybe do a micropulse in that moment what do you think about it? Yeah, I think, I think that's, a, that's a really good idea. Um, you know, I, I think um, the thing that I struggle with is um, the fact that still two thirds of the patients don't need more surgery. But I do think that the more wave, and there are other people, papers out there with, that other people have done with the wave on, um, with eye stent and with dual blade and even now with GAT, um, 
that show the better the wave, the better outcome. So I think uh, Juan Carlos, that's a great idea is, is, you know, maybe um, if a patient doesn't have a wave, we don't do something major like putting in a tube, uh -huh. uh, but maybe you consider doing Micropulse or ECP or something, some added bonus because you know that that patient outflow system is probably not as good as somebody that has this amazing wave. So that's a really, um, that's a great, great, um, great idea. And it would be, what would be fascinating is to, um, to do a study where you take patients that had a bad wave and after a GAT or a dual blade or whatever, mm -hmm. and half of them don't get anything. And then half of them get um, an added micropulse, and then you see how they do long term. Um, yeah, I mean, I, there's so much we don't understand, but I, I love that idea. That sounds like a really good, uh, a really good way to use this information real time in the OR uh, to make a decision that's better for the patient. I mean, I have another question too. When you're doing uh, uh, that test to see wave, you modified the height of the. Uh, no, no. Um, I just do the normal irrigation aspiration, uh, but then I use um, uh, get balance salt on a on a cannula, and I, I physically pump up the eye to a pressure of about twenty five or thirty to kind of right. see that wave. Uh, so that video that I showed, um, I was doing irrigation aspiration, and then um, um, and then afterwards, let me go back a little bit. Afterwards. Uh, what I was doing was, um, uh oh, okay. Um, so this first part is just irrigation aspiration, normal bottle height, and you can see a little bit of the blanching right here. But then what I do uh, later on is I go in with a cannula, uh -huh. and um, and I pump up the pressure very high and it's almost washing out the system. So that pressure there, you can see it's about 30 now. And it's, so that shows you two different things. One is the kind of capacity. Two, I feel like I'm cleaning out the system. And really, um, and what you can see now is how quickly the blood vessels come back. And um, watch how quickly the blood vessels come back and, and how quickly the pressure comes back to normal. And that's not all the same. There's some patients where you do this and the pressure comes down immediately. At the other patients, you do this and the pressure stays up high. So, um, so I think all this is giving us more insight into understanding the patient's outflow capacity in the operating room. Yeah. So let's go back. Um, very good questions. I love this. Uh, so. Um, in conclusion, the, the epistolar venous, venous fluid wave, as we've been talking about, I think is a really good interoperative snapshot of the overall health of the patient's outflow system. And I think patients that have a great wave have a good prognostic indicator, and patients that have a poor wave tend not to do as well. And I think we can use that as a prognostic indicator. Right now, we don't have this way preoperatively of, a, out, of determining a patient's outflow system. Um, but, uh, but maybe we can figure this out preoperatively, but until we can, at least we can use this intraoperative, um, uh, evidence to give a, a sense of, of which patients will do better with MIGS. Uh, and until we have that ability to do this MIGS in patients with an outflow system and a TRAB or a tube or a Zen or something, or an in-focus in a patient that needs a new outflow system, until we have that ability, there's gonna constantly be this debate about the MIGs and the MEGs, uh, minimally invasive or minimally effective. Uh, so now's a little time, <laughs> some, some uh, com comedic interface, but we've done it next stage. I'm gonna talk about GAT, but maybe Corona beer is gonna have to change its name to something less scary, like Ebola. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but we should also take advantage of our alone time, uh, home time and being quarantined with our family and putting our kids to work, making them help cook, playing card yeah. games and just being silly and, and acting crazy. So hopefully you guys are all staying sane through this quarantine and, uh, and also and take, and taking advantage of, of, of this time with our family. So, but the other advantage we could have, so this was a, a gift from a friend while I was down there and 
you know, last time I was in Peru, in Paracas, we stopped the whole meeting to watch the Peruvian national team play. So now I'm going to stop this and, and have a cheers to my <laughs> cheers, Peruvian man. family and friends and some Pisco to help make this whole uh, coronavirus a little bit more palatable. So salud. <laughs> Ah, salute. Okay. So now let's talk about um let's talk about cat. Uh, or circumferential trabeculotomy. So this is good. Thank you. Okay. So you know, trabeculotomy, um, uh, it's an old fashioned surgery and it's been around for a while. Um and, um, and it traditionally was done using a conjunctival flap and a conjunctival dissection to find Schlem's canal externally. And mm -hmm. it took some time, you know, it took a lot of time. Um, and and it, it, would, it was relatively invasive. You could do it with a suture or you could do it with a, a catheter. And uh, this has been around for a while from, uh, from the 60s. All right. Um, this is one of the early articles of ab external trabeculotomy, which is Redmond Smith would isolate, cut down, isolate Schlem's canal, pass a suture a couple clock hours, cut down again and pass it again. Um, and then he would do it after about six clock hours and then pull. And, um, and I love this picture right here because when you look on gonioscopy, you can see this. And this I think is important because you can see this you know, if when there's when Schlem's canal gets cannulated, it tears into circumferentially when you pull, it pulls anteriorly and you create that flap, that long flap with this anterior cleavage. Now, other surgeries like TRAB 360 and everything like that, they create a flap like this, and I think they're less successful because it's tending to close down again after you open it. But when you cut and you do circumferential and you get that anterior cleavage, then you're more likely to have that trabecular flap uh, closed. And Redmond Smith was such a great thinker because you know, he drew this back in the 60s. Um, but now even to this day, we can take the same pictures with a fancier image, uh, but he knew this way back in the 60s. You know? But you see, this was the trabecular flap that was cut right here and the whole thing falls down. And he even described that when there's interaction between this flap and the iris, it can stick together and it's more likely to keep that flap open. So when you do GAT on a patient, look at them afterwards a month later on gonioscopy and you can see this and you can see that the flap stays nice and open. So, you know, why, why are we even thinking about trabeculotomy? So, you know, back in the 50s, Morton Grant did a study and he felt that um, almost 75% of the resistance to outflow is in the trabecular meshwork. Uh, David Epstein redid it, and it's about, about 65%, I think now, about 65% of the resistance to outflow is in that trabecular meshwork. And that's, I think, where the major resistance is in primary opening of glaucoma. So this was a study of ab external trabeculotomy out of Japan uh, in, in developmental glaucoma or pediatric glaucoma, showing nearly 90% success rates. So never do we see that. Never do we see a uh, 90% success rate in, um, in, uh, in glaucoma surgery. We never do, right? Um, but, um, but we do in, in congenital glaucoma and juvenile open angle glaucoma because we know in those patients, the problem is the trabecular, is the trabecular meshwork. Yeah. Here's a, um, a study looking at primary open angle glaucoma and pseudoexfoliation, again, ab external trabeculotomy taking the flap, doing the conjunctival dissection, and, um, and showing that at three years, four years, success rates of 60% with FOAG, that's the same thing that the, the PTVT and the TVT studies showed with TRABs and tubes. So here you have this almost the same exact success rate, but you're not making a TRAB, you're not giving a bleb, you're not putting a tube in the eye. And even with pseudoxfoliation, at the three and four year point, you're seeing success rates of 70%, that's better than TVT. Um, and this is without a flap, I mean, without a bleb. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a patient, uh, a study that showed steroid induced glaucoma 
showing that even just a harm trabeculotome, just looking, opening up a little bit of the angle is more successful than the, the trabeculectomy group. So steroid induced glaucoma, I think this is even better than trabeculectomies, not equivalent. And this study, you know, there's the question of how much of the angle you have to open up. And, um, and I think that, you know, when you compare the harm trabeculotome to a circumferential trabeculotomy, um, it's, it's showing that with the more of the angle you open up, the, the better results you get. Um, so I think it is important to either open up at least 180, if not 360 degrees. Um, but what's the problem with that ab external technique, right? You have to do a conjunctival dissection, a scleral flap, it, it takes a long time, um, and it's pretty invasive. And so we're seeing this evolution of trabeculotomy in our, in our lifetimes. I mean, in the past, you know, 30, 40, 50 years. Um, and and we're, 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 our group and uh, myself and my partners have come up with a, an ab internal trabeculotomy or a GAT surgery um, where you are within the eye through two small paracentesis with a $4 suture or a catheter um, cannulating, passing it around and retrieving it and basically being able to do a 360 degree trabeculotomy uh, without doing a flap and a conjunctival dissection. So this is with a $5, $4 suture. You do an MVR blade, you cut down, you can see the back wall of Schlem's canal. Then you wanna go parallel, almost tangential to the back wall. You don't wanna break through and you really wanna just go parallel until you pass it around 360 degrees and then you retrieve it and then you pull. So here's a video of it. Um, I hope the resolution is okay. So use a cautery and just, you wanna see the slightest change. You wanna create the smallest bulb possible. And here I'm doing a 23 gauge needle. Now I actually just do a paracentesis and a paracentesis with the same blade, 15 degree blade, paracentesis, paracentesis. Um, and then this is a, an MVR blade. You can also do a 23 gauge needle. Um, and you can see, I'm gonna push down on the back wall so you can see the back wall of Schlem's canal. And then I wanna go as parallel as possible to the back mm -hmm. wall. You don't wanna break through. And usually after you've gone 90, to 90 degrees, you really don't have to worry about, about it. But now you can see it's getting harder, right? It's the feel. So I've gone about 180 degrees. And so now I'm pushing this way and I have to get the suture this way. So you can feel that resistance until that suture comes back around and you can just keep pushing. If you keep pushing like this, you don't feel a resistance, you're in the wrong space. But if you keep, if you push and you feel the resistance, you want to feel it, and then you pull out, I hold it here, and then I externalize, and you get that circumferential anterior cleavage. And watch this wave, again, I'm just going to pump up with, about with a cannula. Watch this wave, and the more I do it, the more the wave I see. So if, at first, I didn't see that great of a wave, but I'm going to keep pumping it, keep pumping it, keep pumping it. And now you see this amazing wave, right? So I think this is a diagnostic. It's showing you the outflow system. But I also think there's a therapeutic component that I'm cleaning out and popping open the outflow system and cleaning it out. Um, look how quickly it came back, all right? So I think this, is, this serves two purposes. One, it shows us. And then two, I think it's, there's a therapeutic component. So that's fun. And, and that's great. There's a question from the audience. Yes. And, uh, what is your percentage of hyphema in this kind of surgery? Um, I'm gonna get to that. Uh, it's about a third. That's about a third. But a hyphema is actually good, right? Yes. Because if you don't have a hyphema, then you're less likely to get blood reflux into the eye and that, that whole system, that whole pathway uh, is, um, is less likely. So if you don't see a wave, you're likely not going to see a hyphema. And I think your likelihood of success is bad. So I think a hyphema is a good sign. Um, but I'll get to the, the complications um, of the surgery in a couple of slides. Okay. So this was our first report on it in 2014 in the Blue Journal, where we took our first case, our first patients of one eye. Um, and we excluded the bilateral ones. We randomly chose one eye in the bilateral cases. And we had 57 eyes with primary open angle glaucoma and 28 of secondary. And at 12 months, the primary angle glaucoma group went, had an average lowering pressure of 11.1, and they're on 1.1 fewer meds. 
in the secondary group, their pressures lowered by almost 20 millimeters of mercury uh, and were almost on two fewer men. So the cumulative proportion of uh, failure at one year ranged somewhere between 0.1 and 0.3, depending on the group, and I'll get to that. We published this in our JOAG, our Juvenile Open Angle Glaucoma in Congenital Patients. And this was, I've done this in a three month old baby, um, but this study we did ranged from 17 to 30. Um, and their pressures went from 27 to 14 on 2.6 to 0.8 meds. And this is tremendously successful. And if, if there's ever a surgery where we're gonna win 95% of the time, 90% of the time, it's gonna be GAT in patients that have primary congenital glaucoma or juvenile open angle glaucoma, because we know the problem is a trabecular dysgenesis, a problem in the trabecular meshwork. Yeah. So then we published our two-year data um, in journal, uh, the Journal of Glaucoma. And let's get to that. So you see um, that the, um, the mean age was the patients in their 60s and 70s. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we had the we had pseudo exfoliation, we had pigmentary uveitic, um, but the key thing is this slide. And when you look at any any paper on glaucoma surgery, especially on MIGs, these are the three things you need to pay attention to. One is again what their pre-op meds and IOP, um, but the th the most important one I think is this last one, the stage of disease, right? Because if you look at the eye stent data. Those patients had mean deviations of anywhere from zero to minus three. But look at these patients. This is patients that had mean deviations of anywhere from 10 to 11 to eight. This is real disease. This is real glaucoma. This is yeah, not yeah, high yeah. patients. These are patients that have already lost vision and are showing you that they have the potential to go blind, right? So this is real glaucoma. Um, and so what do we see? At two years, we had decent follow-up in most groups, 60 to 70% follow-up. But across the board, so this is, let's orient ourselves a little bit to this, uh, to this, um, this format, these different columns. So this is POAG. These are patients that have primary open angle glaucoma. This is combined POAG. So these are patients that have both POAG and underwent a GAT and a FACO. Um, this is um, pseudophagic POAG, so patients that were pseudophagic and had GAT. This is secondary or other, patients that had secondary glaucoma and only had a GAT. This is other combined, so this is phaco GAT in secondary glaucoma. And this is other prior cataract surgery, so this is pseudophagic patients with secondary glaucoma. So it's nice to break it up into all the different categories. And you can see across the board, be it POAG, phaco GAT and POAG, pseudo and POAG, other, we're seeing pressures going from 24 to 26 to 22 to 30, down to 15 and 13 across the board. And meds from three to 2.9, 2.6, down to 1.8 to one. And if this is the cumulative proportion of failure, so there's a Kaplan-Meier curve showing over time the patients that failed and it's broken down by the different colors. Now, you know, you'd expect the secondary group to do better than the primary group because secondary, we know the problem is the trabecular meshwork. So the greens all did better. And then the FACO, combined FACO groups tended to do better as well. Yeah. Now this group right here, this prior cataract surgery POAG group did not do as well. And we'll talk about it, why? This is the likelihood that they would need to have more surgery, trabs, tubes, everything. So you can see at one year, they all, most of them did not need more surgery, you know, across the board, chance of surgery of about 0.1, there's a 0.1%, a 0.1 or 10% chance, 15% chance they'd need more surgery. And at two years, um, you know, across the board, anywhere from 0.1 or less than 0.1 to 0.2, 25% chance they need surgery, except in this POAG pseudophagic group. At two years, there's about a third chance they would need more surgery, but we'll talk about that again. That group is weird. Yeah. Now, this is interesting, and this goes back to the wave group, right? 
So this is just the POAG GAT group, only the patients with the primary opening or glaucoma that underwent GAT. And I broke them down between a mean deviation of minus three and better, minus three to minus 14, and then minus 15 and worse. And what do we see, right? Again, the patients that had a mild glaucoma, mild to moderate glaucoma, any a mean deviation of less than minus 14 or minus 14 and better, their cumulative <laughs> proportion of failure at no, two no, years. Sorry, why do you, do you change the HODAP classification there in the visual field? Uh, I, uh, this is just kind of the standard for mild, moderate, and advanced glaucoma. Yeah. Uh -huh. So right. this is all POAG breaking uh -huh. down mild, moderate, advanced glaucoma. Okay. And what do we see in this advanced group, right, that had a mean deviation of minus 15 and worse? At six months, 90% of them failed. So this goes back to that wave study, right? Mm -hmm. Where we had the patients that had a bad wave, didn't, didn't, they didn't have any success, where patients with an amazing wave had a great success. So here, this is saying that maybe instead of the wave, maybe preoperatively, if a patient has advanced glaucoma, minus 15, we shouldn't do, we shouldn't do a GAT. These patients don't have an intact outflow system. These patients need a new drainage system. These mm -hmm. patients need a Trabra too. So this may be the stage of disease, may be a proxy for a patient's outflow capacity. Now this is only true in the United States that I've seen because in the United States, patients are on drops for 20 years, right? So their mm -hmm. eyes are being abused by drops. When I first went and did GAT in a developing country, um, they gave me the worst cases, right? I was in India and they gave me the worst cases and all the patients had mean deviations of minus 15. And I was thinking, oh great, they're all gonna fail and they're gonna think that this surgery is fake and, and, and it's not gonna work and they're gonna think that I'm making this up. What's interesting in India, and I'm not sure about Peru, but I imagine Peru is similar for some patients. Patients aren't on drops for 20 years. They don't use their drops. They present with a pressure of 30 and a mean deviation of minus 15. They present with advanced glaucoma. They have, their eyes are still virgin. They haven't been abused by drops. And in India, I didn't see this. In India, the patients that have not been on drops for a long time do amazingly well. So I think this, this finding is more in a, in a healthcare system where patients have been on drops for a long time. In a healthcare system where patients present with advanced glaucoma and high pressure and vision loss, their eyes behave more like virgin eyes that have been untouched. So we're still learning a lot about this, but I think if a patient presents to your office with advanced glaucoma and they haven't been on drops for a long time, or maybe just Timolol for three months, I don't think this, this applies. I think that you can assume that they still have a good outflow system. Okay. So here goes to that question that was asked before about, um, about complications and how many patients had hyphema. So at one week, about, and this is a layered hyphema, not a micro hyphema, but a layered hyphema, about a third of patients at one week had a layered hyphema. And after about a month, the vast majority of it went away. Um, other complications um, were sometimes if you're not careful, you can create an iridodialysis or cyclodialysis. These heal on their own usually. You don't need to be surgically repaired. Um, sometimes you can get a decimase detachment. Yeah. Most of those go away as well. Um, and, um, and then sometimes this right here was a one recurrent hyphema. This was my yoga instructor that every time she did downward dog or did yoga, she would get a recurrent hyphema. So that also taught me that if I have a patient that likes to scuba dive or yoga or things like that, I may consider not doing a GAT or maybe opening up only a small amount of the angle um, and having a discussion with my patients about, about their behavior. Um, so, you know, there's more and more data coming out on GAT, not from our group. And this is what's, all, this is what's exciting, all right? 
because when you come up with a surgery or you invent a surgery and you report your results, it's great. You know that, you know, the people that have been, I've done maybe, you know, 3,000, 4,000 GATs um, for the past eight years. And it's great if I can do a GAT and it works, but what's important is can other people do GAT and have the same success rates? And what's also exciting is the more people that are doing GAT, the more great minds that are going to come out and we're going to learn more about GAT. And because uh, there's still so much we don't understand. And so I think what's exciting about this when I see more and more data coming out uh, is I think we're going to learn more about GAT. Um, and, uh, and I'm excited to see, you know, the, the Peruvian experience and the experience, the experience in, in Latin America and Central and South America. Yeah. Um, uh, David, there, uh, I saw some article in your beginning of doing GAT that you were doing with the catheter, right? Because of the light. Yes. And now that you are uh, GAT, uh, and I was beginning to do that, uh, I was waiting for the prolink to show, you know, and that moment is kind of stressful because you don't see it. So uh, in these cases, in this technique, I'm using now the AMET uh, gonioscopic because I can rotate the lens and I can see where I am all the time. Yeah. I think it's a good option if you don't have a light to use this uh, lens in GAT. Yeah, you know, the, um, I, I think so. So um, there's a couple of things is when I'm teaching people to do GAT around the world, um, a lot of people are telling me they like the proline better than the catheter because the catheter is more prone to kinking. Uh -huh. The catheter yes. is nice because you can see the blinking and it gives you that reassurance. Uh -huh. um, but if it kinks, you're done. Um, the proline, what's interesting is and again the more you the more experience you get with it the more of a feel you get yeah so i was saying that when you first do it you can look just with the Schwann jacobs and you can kind of move to the side and see uh -huh. that you're in the right space and uh -huh. once you're in the right space then you keep passing and as the suture goes around you know starts here as it goes around as it goes around right when it gets to 180 and you're pushing this way and the uh -huh. suture is going this way, you're doing this, it starts to, you can feel the resistance, it starts to get more difficult. And uh -huh. if you don't feel that resistance, you're in the wrong place. All right. So there's a video on my YouTube channel where before I do the surgery, outside the eye on the surface, uh, and I'll show this next week um, before I start, uh, is before I put the suture in the eye, I'll put it on the surface of the eye and I'll kind of figure out the circumference of the canal with the suture and then I'll mark it and then I'll bend the suture so that when I'm passing it, if I see that bend and I don't see my suture coming around, I know I've gone too far. Uh -huh. So that's another option. The Ahmed gonioprism prism is a great idea. The only problem I don't, the only thing I don't like about that is to do the surgery, you have to tilt the scope, tilt the head, tilt the head, tilt the scope. And, um, to look with the gonio, with the Ahmed gonio prism, you have to kind of put the head back, put the scope back and look. So it kind of decreases your efficiency in the OR. So, uh, but I think it's a great idea. You can look and see it. Um, uh, but usually what's interesting is that it's either gonna stop or if it goes in the, if it breaks through and goes in the supercoil space, it's gonna usually do it within the first 90 degrees. Okay. And so you can see whether you're in the right space or not um early on uh, before you do it but uh but it's a it's a feel but it's again it's a learning curve uh, now i've switched entirely i do almost every case with a with a proline suture um but some people if you have access to it and the cost is not a problem um some people like to learn with the catheter uh-huh and um, there's some question also from the audience uh, do you have experience with a 6-0 proline uh, what proline? I'm sorry, you broke up. 6-0. Six 6-0? Oh. Yeah. yeah, you know, early on, we tried everything. We tried 4-0 nylon, 5-0 nylon, 6-0 nylon, 7-0 nylon, 4-0 uh, proline, 5-0 proline, 6-0 proline, 7-0 proline. Um, externally, we would classically do the 6-0 proline. 
but something about just the limited movement in the eye mm -hmm. uh, and you kind of have to push really hard especially at about 180 degrees that i feel like the based on all the sutures i tried um and all the different sizes um i found that the best one for me was the 50 proline when i did the 60 i felt like it would be more likely to stop and i wouldn't have the strength to push it through it would kink more but I felt like the 5 -0 was the perfect mix. Uh, but some people, I know some people do 6 -0 and like it. So, um, you know, so I think it's a matter of your, um, your comfort. And, um, and there's not a right answer. And it's whatever works best for you. So. Um, um, so so in, in, in summary, uh, in a patient with advanced glaucoma and pseudophagic, you don't do that. You are thinking of something else, right? Not in the United States, because most of my advanced patients have had been on drops for a very long time. That's POAG. Pseudoexfoliation, secondary glaucomas, I'll still do GAT in advanced cases. Mm -hmm. And in newly diagnosed glaucoma or in, in other countries where I know the patient has not been on drops for a long time, um, I'll consider GAT. All right. Um, and in steroid induced glaucoma? Yeah, there's, a, there's some papers out there now, but even in our cases, I think it works amazingly well for steroid induced glaucoma. But the only problem is that the patient is still with steroid treatment, right? Yeah, so, and it's, it's a, that's a really interesting point. Yeah. So the classic teaching is that steroid induced glaucoma is a problem in the trabecular meshwork. Yeah. Right, you get deposition of, of, of glycoproteins in the, in the, uh, in the trabecular meshwork um, and you remove that and then they, that should fix the problem. What happens in, in after GAT at about two weeks, three weeks on being on steroids, you can sometimes see a steroid response. And we actually think it's because some deposition over the back wall of Schlem's canal but what's amazing is I've seen pyrocarpine take a patient that's having a steroid response, go from a pressure of 30 to a pressure of 17, just with one drop of pylo once a day or one drop of pylo twice a day. So I still will use pyrocarpine as my first go-to. Um, and you keep the steroid going, and I'll get to this more. You keep the steroid going um, until the eye is quiet and then you can taper the steroids. And if they have a steroid response, you treat it with pylocarpine and then with a beta blocker, and then maybe with a prostaglandin analog. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, do, do you still, ah, you're going. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we have some, I have, I have some slides. I know we're, um, um, we're well, I, have, I have a lot of slides still, but we can, I'll, and I'm gonna talk, talk on this, but. Um, yeah, sure. How are we doing on, are we doing okay on time? Yes. Okay. Okay. So in conclusion, you know, GAT is a, a novel, safe, minimally invasive, conjunctival sparing surgery. The success rates are pretty high and the cumulative proportion of failure at 24 months ranges anywhere from 18 to 0.35. Um, and, um, and the number of eyes needing more surgery um, are anywhere from 0.09 to 0.4. But when you exclude this pseudophagic POAG group, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about, that chance of needing more surgery is anywhere from 0.1 to 0.28 at two years, which is pretty good. Um, the secondary groups tended to do better and the combined FACO GAT groups tended to do better. Um, there's this correlation between mean deviation and visual field stage and a patient's outflow system or success rates. And maybe that can be used as a proxy for the patient's outflow capacity. The pseudophagic POAG group had the highest rate of failure. They were tend to be older. They tended to have a more advanced stage of glaucoma. Um, but a lot of them failed, not because they had a pressure of 17 or 15, but they failed because they needed more surgery because the surgeon, we wanted their pressures to be down to 11 or 12. And this is still our initial data. Um, the very first two years experience with GAT, when we first developed this, we were doing it in everybody. Um, so, uh, this was the very first kind of, um, 
experience we had. Now we're getting smart about who does better or not. But a lot of the patients fail, not because they had a pressure of 25 or 20, it's because a pressure of, of 16 or 17, but we needed a pressure of 11. Uh, we need longer follow-up. I would love to see a prospective GAT trial um, in the US as well as overseas. Um, and this is, you know, the, the suture GAT is really a nice option, especially in healthcare systems where, uh, you know, cost-effective delivery of healthcare is important. And I think when it comes to all this MIG stuff, uh, we do need to start talking about uh, cost-effective delivery of care. This is from one of my colleagues and friends in, in Canada, and he did a cost, a Canadian dollar, uh, per millimeter of mercury and how much it cost based on eye stent, Zen gel stent, Cypass, Trebectome, and it was it went anywhere from $200 per millimeter of mercury down to a GAT, which was 81 cents per millimeter of mercury. And that's just a ballpark based on, on the, some of the trials, but it gives you a sense of how much we're paying per millimeter, millimeter of mercury lowering. Um, and uh, this is not a map of COVID. Uh, this is a map of, uh, of GAT <laughs> around the world. And as far as I know, I mean, this is, I, I don't know. I mean, some people are, I was no way for us, for us to know this is spreading by just this kind of interaction of us teaching each other and learning from each other. Uh, but as far as I know, I think GAT is being done now around the world in uh, over 22 countries, uh, maybe more. Um, this is just based on my little internet search and my friends and colleagues around the country, around the world, um, and by looking at YouTube and seeing how many people have posted videos of GAT on YouTube and where we have gone to help teach GAT. So it's spreading and it's very exciting to have a cost-effective option. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how some of the nuances of, of, of how I do GAT. Mm -hmm. um, so, and who I don't do it in. So I don't do it in patients that we talked about in advanced disease or patients that can't tolerate medications and need a pressure of 11 or 12 on no drops. GAT won't get you there. Uh, blood thinners are an issue and important. And if a patient can't be taken off blood thinners, um, I, I won't do a GAT. I may consider doing a goniotomy, um, but I won't do a GAT. And the first couple of weeks, I have the patient sleep on their back with their head above your heart, like a classic hyphema precautions. Um, if they have an unstable lens, I don't want to, you know, you do require some manipulation in the anterior chamber, so I don't want to dislodge a lens. Or if they have a lot of broad PAS, that's going to cause a lot of bleeding and a lot of scarring, and I won't do angle surgery in patients that have extensive broad PAS. Yeah. Uh, this is how I treat my patients. Um, um, uh, the first week, put them aggressively with steroids and antibiotics. At one week, if the IOP is 17 or above, I'll add pilo at night. And if their pressure is above 22, I'll add pilo twice a day. At one week, I'll stop the antibiotic. Um, and I'll have them sleep like then on their back with their head over their heart for a week or two. And what's interesting is, so we talked about the anatomy of the angle and the outflow pathway. And what we know about the angle is that it's not all equal. There, the nasal angle is the more important angle, and that's the angle that has the most outflow system. So say, for example, we did the patient's right eye. If they sleep on their left side, all the blood is gonna pool right in the most important quadrant. So I have the patient sleep on the side of the surgery, which is the opposite of what they think. Anybody who has the right eye operate on is they're gonna to think to lay on the left side. Mm -hmm. I tell my patients that if, if I did your right eye, I want you to lay on your right side so the blood pools temporal and protects that nasal angle. Um, that's very key and it's counterintuitive. Um, if, if they have a layered and significant hyphema, like three millimeter or more at one week, I do have a tendency to take them back and wash it out. Um, I treat the pot with pilocarpine and with beta blocker on, uh, even if I see a steroid response and I keep them on aggressive steroids until the eye is completely quiet and the anterior chamber is completely quiet. Um, so this is kind of pearls for early angle surgery. Um, you have to understand an ang the angle anatomy. You need to understand what you're looking at. Um, I would say the first skill is just understanding how to do intraoperative gonioscopy. Um, and 
what I would say is just practice. So when we can get back to operating on normal cases, you're doing a cataract surgery, you're doing a normal FACO, and you're in the operating room, you put the lens in the bag and everything is fine. The anterior chamber still has viscoelastic until you wash it out. At this moment, just tilt the patient's head, tilt the scope, put on the gonio prism, and just look. And then get your second instrument and just put it in the eye and kind of get a sense of how it feels. And do that 10 times before you even consider doing any type of angle surgery. Just get that sense of what it feels like to put something in the angle after a normal cataract surgery, once the lens is in the bag and everything looks pretty safe. Once you get that sense, then you can start playing with angle surgery. And then I have all my patients, the difference between this view right here, this middle view, and this view is having the patient in reverse Trendelenburg. So I have all my patients, when I operate, I have all my patients in reverse Trendelenburg. Their head's a little bit above their heart. You're minimizing episclerovenous pressure. And that minimizes the risk of blood reflux, maximizes your view, and it also, um, I think, minimizes the risk of a um, supracortical hemorrhage on the table. So I think that there's a lot of reasons to be safe and, uh, and keep the patient like this during all surgeries. And I do that with everything, with my phacos, traps, tubes, everything. And also with phaco? I'm sorry? Also, also with phaco? Everything, with phaco too. Uh, everything, yeah. just like this, because you minimize episclerovenous pressure, and that, I think, minimizes your risk of a supracortical hemorrhage on the table. So I think it keeps everything safer. So, yes. and, and it's not bad just to do that. Um, mm -hmm. So um, here's some pearls for like kind of, if this is the eye and you're sitting temporal, this is the right eye. Uh, I go counterclockwise with the right eye, because if you start here, I said the most resistance, can you see my cursor? You can see my pointer, yeah. right? Yeah. You start here, uh, the most resistance is gonna be right here, right? And then right here, about 180 to 270 degrees. So say it stops right here, then I can move to the top of the bed, look down and, 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 and retrieve it from the inferior angle, right? If I went the opposite way and I went this way, then it's most likely to stop right here. And then you're gonna have to lay on top of the patient. And that's usually not a good thing. So uh, in the right eye, I go counterclockwise, but in the left eye, you're sitting here, you go clockwise so that uh, you start here it goes around, and then if it's going to stop at 270 degrees, you're going to go 270 degrees and stop here. Then you can move to the top of the bed and, and, and cut down. What's nice about the proline is that if it does stop, if you just pull on it, it usually tears through, and then you can go the opposite way. This is more important with the catheter because the catheter, if it stops and you pull on it, it'll just come back out. It won't tear through. Now, someone asked about blood reflux and hyphema. So what we've also done, we've become smarter on, on the, the wave and, uh, and how much blood is in the eye. So if I see an amazing wave, I think the patient has a good into, inflow, intact outflow system. And, uh, and I think they're more likely to have blood reflux. So then I will leave some helon in the eye. If they have an amazing wave and a lot of blood reflux, I'll pump up the pressure with, with Helon, and I'll leave about 30 to 40% Helon fill. If they don't have an amazing wave and not a lot of blood reflux, then I'll leave uh, maybe about a 10% Helon fill. And that's because you wanna protect the patient against early post-operative hypotony. So in the first day, they still have aqueous suppressants on board because two days ago they were on glaucoma drops. So their aqueous production is, low, is down and the eye's been stressed just from having surgery. So their aqueous production is gonna be lower so in the first couple of days, you're gonna have a low pressure. And if the pressure is low and the pressure is eight, you're gonna have a risk of having more blood reflux in the eye. So you want that eye to have a pressure about 15. So I leave a little bit of helon in the eye just to keep the eye formed. Um, so this is, if you guys wanna take a picture of this, this is kind of just what I use for GAT. Um, I like Epsilon. They're the company that makes a lot of my instruments. I have no financial interest, but he sells a lot of these instruments at cost to, um, to developing countries. Um, and these instruments can be purchased. They're very high quality um, and um, at a very low cost. Um, so he makes all of my instruments now. Um, 
in, in, uh, in the US, he charges more because that's where they make their money. But in other countries, um, in Asia, in Africa, and in some uh, Central South American countries, he'll sell it to it at a, at a discounted rate. Um, and I can get you his information uh, next time for my next week's talk. But these are the instruments I use um, for GAP. Um, so, you know, for those of us who wish to learn GAT, um, uh, you know, uh, we have every year at the Academy of Ophthalmology, we have a course. Um, I, I have an open door policy, you know, once we can start traveling again and it's safe and we're operating again. Um, if you want to come to Dallas and, and come spend time with me, you're welcome to come to the operating room with me and we can, we can learn together. Um, and, you know, God willing, one day I'll, um, I'll be down um, in, in, in Peru with you all and, um, and maybe we can do some GAT while I'm down there. And I'd be happy to, to, to help teach uh, doing some live surgery down there um, when, when we're able to travel again. Um, but it's interesting, you know, when, when there's not a company that's pushing this instrument or pushing this device where they're making a lot of money, it's interesting that this is the best way that, and this I think is the more pure way of teaching and learning from ourselves because uh, you don't have a drug rep or a device rep coming to your office saying, hey, use this proline suture. Uh, this is the only way we're able to teach it and learn. And, and so it really, I think, as a professional society, we should take a step back and think of the way we now, after we've finished our residency, how we learn the vast majority of our learning, unless we do these things, which, uh, Juan Carlos, thank you for organizing this, um, unless we do these non-company sponsored uh, talks where we can educate ourselves through our societies, uh, yeah. We're not learning, and we're only learning things that industry wants us to learn. Uh, so this is this is my favorite thing to do, is to learn from each other um, in a non-industry sponsored format. Uh, so some random advice, uh, you know, I want you all to please stay safe and and take care of yourselves and your families and your patients. Um, and I, you know, this is such a, a curious and interesting time. Uh, but you know, I think a lot of us have young kids. And um, a lot of us work very hard um, and spend a lot of time taking care of patients. Um, but what I'm trying to do during all this anxiety and the fear of the unknown of what's happening is trying to have these types of exchanges with my friends and colleagues and also um, take advantage of this time. Because I think once all this is over, God willing, very soon, um, this is such a unique month to spend such close time with our family and our kids that, uh, that I don't think we're ever gonna get back again. Um, so, um, and then also know that Pisco makes everything better. So uh, don't, don't we're, we're definitely using, uh, enjoying life together as a family. Um, so, you know, I have such fond memories of, um, of my time down in Paracas and in Lima and, and with, with all of you, uh, with the Peruvian Ophthalmology, Society of Ophthalmology, um, I had such a great time last time I was there, uh, and you guys were such warm and, and gracious hosts. Um, Juan Carlos, thank you for organizing this. And, um, and you know, I, I think back at this time with all my friends down there and have such a great, uh, such great memories. And I can't wait to be down there again and, um, and have some fun. So uh, thank you all for your time. Um, this is my phone number, uh, my email address. Um, and uh, this is my YouTube channel. I have a lot of videos on there. Uh, please, um, please don't hesitate to, to reach out if you have any questions during this time. And uh, I think I'm on schedule next week to talk about some other fun stuff. So I look forward to, um, to having another session with you all next week. So thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, are you able to answer some questions? Of course, of course. There's some question that said, uh, in your experience now, uh, do you prefer a partial trabeculotomy or do you still prefer a 360? Because you can do like a partial only in the nasal quadrant and you have mo almost the most uh, amount of collectors there, so. Yeah. You know, there's a, a, a big push now, most of it out of Canada, to do what they call it, they call it a hemi gap, which is they treat 180. And they're soon to be um, publishing their data. 
Um, it looks it looks pretty good. I, I think um, the Hemigat or treating 180. If you treat 180, uh, I think you should probably treat the uh, the nasal quadrant, um, mm -hmm. and because uh, that's where the highest collector channels are. I'm going to change this picture. This is my favorite picture too. Um, <laughs> uh, but if you use that the nasal quadrant. Um, I think it can work, especially in patients that have a higher risk of bleeding or you don't need as much lower pressure lowering. Um, I still think that if you want the biggest bang for your, uh, for your buck or, or the biggest effect, I still think treating 360 is gonna, treat, is gonna get you more. Um, but I think if you, if you, when you're learning, um, I think a hemigat is probably gonna be easier because you can just pass at 90, pull, pass at 90 and pull. Um, and as long as you treat the, uh, the nasal quadrant, um, I, I think it would be good. So um, I think it's a great option, especially um, um, when you're first learning to do GAT. I think it's a great, great and safe option. And, um, but, and I, think that in, I think soon um, there's gonna be some data out there that's gonna show that it's almost as good as 360. I still, you know, I still go in and treat um, 360. And when I want to treat 180, I usually will do a, 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 goni, a hook dual blade goniotomy. But I think I'm going to start playing with, um, with doing a hemigat. All right. All right. What There's one more here that I saw. Ah, okay. Do you have experience of GAT after trap? Yes, yes. Um, and uh, we actually were published on it um, about, I think in 2016 in the journal Glaucoma, where we did, um, uh, GAT after trabs and tubes, uh -huh. and um, um, and we actually found some decent success, about sixty percent success rate. So um, the thing that when you do that, say for if you're doing a trabeculectomy and you do a GAT on gonioscopy, you have to look where your sclerostomy is, because if your sclerostomy is involving the canal. Um, then when you go through it around, it may stop there. And you have to go the opposite way. If it's anterior to the canal and the canal is untouched, then it's not a problem. But you need to be aware of where, so look preoperatively where your goniotomy is, sorry, where your sclerotomy site is. Um, and then you may need to avoid that. And that may be a good case for the hemigat where you just go around it and you treat half of it. Well, the same thing is true with the tube. Um, and um, if, if the tube isn't going into the anterior chamber and it's going through the canal, uh, then you won't be able to get around with it. So you need to make sure you understand where the, um, where the sclerotomy site is and where the tube enters the eye uh, before you do GAT after uh, a trab or a tube. Mm -hmm. But in truth now, and I'll talk about this next week, uh, with this technique we've come to, we've, we've developed to do a blood revision, an ab internal blood revision, um, I do that instead of doing a GAT after a TRAB. Huh. And with tubes, failed tubes, I've had very, very good success with low energy CPC diode, you know, mm -hmm. 800 milliwatts, 900 milliwatts, 30 spots, 4,000 milliseconds after a tube. It works really, really well. So since I've started doing that, I haven't really been doing a lot of GATs. Do you mean in that uh, continuous wave or ECP or micropulse? Um, usually CPC, uh, not micropulse, just traditional CPC. Uh, continuous uh, wave. Yes. The micropulse, which I'm still trying to play with. The, my biggest problem with micropulse is that I feel like a third of the time it works really well. Uh -huh. A third of the time it looks like it hasn't done anything. <laughs> and then a third of the time, the eye looks really angry and inflamed and, and upset. And I still am kind of, we're playing with our settings and trying to get a sense. So I still think that um, after a tube, um, the CPC diode, the continuous wave, 
in my hands is still a more predictable um, way of, of, of getting the pressure down. Mm, perfect. And there's other question. Uh, is a coincidence that we were talking uh, last night. Uh, do you have experience with viscodilation of the slim canal and also GAT? Uh, yes. Yeah, so whenever I whenever I do it, when I do viscodilation with GAT with a catheter, when so when I do GAT with a catheter, uh -huh, yes. When I do GAT with a catheter, I I always viscodilate. Um, there's not really been any studies, and when I look at my 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 own personal experience with GAT and viscodilating, and then GAT versus the proline GAT. I don't mm -hmm. see a difference in outcomes. And I think it's, you know, that, that maneuver when you see me pumping up the eye and seeing more of a wave, I think that maneuver is possibly viscodilating or not viscodilating, but dilating and cleaning out the system. Uh -huh. So um, I think for this is, for me, this question is more of a cost thing. If you, yeah. if you have the money to spend $700 on the catheter, um, you can, then I would say viscodilate. Mm -hmm. um, if you are doing the suture, I don't think there's a difference between doing the GAT with the suture and then pumping up the eye and washing the outflow system, washing the collector channels. Um, I think that serves the same purpose as viscodilation. When you look at so the data that's out there that where they just do viscodilation, um, and you know, Juan Carlos and I were talking about this last night, the, um, the data is not really that good that I've seen. Most of the people, most of the data that I've seen that is actually good with viscodilation is, patient, is in patients where they did half, they did a hemigat, where they opened mm -hmm. up half the angle and they viscodilated. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't know whether just doing a hemigat and pumping it with what BSS or viscodilating and doing a hemigat would be a different. There's no study comparing those two. Mm -hmm. And I think it depends on how many clicks you do also, right? Yeah, because, yeah. Um, uh -huh. But be careful because you can cause it, if you don't go, if you do too many clicks and you go too slow, you can sometimes cause a decimase detachment. Yes, yes, I know. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah. And there, uh, yeah, I think. I think Juan Carlos. Done. Sí, Gustavo. Sí, um, de pronto, eh, el tamaño, la longitud de la ostomía, el trabéculo, eh, aproximadamente. Eh, ¿Te refieres a la goniotomía que hace? Uy, se fue el señor. Ahora sí. Aló. ¿Aló? ¿Me escuchaste? Sí. ¿Te refieres a la goniotomía que hace para insertar el ah, prolene? Sí, la longitud. Ah, ¿cuánto de longitud? Ok. Sí. David Binder. Uy, creo que... Está baja la señal, ¿no? Yo, yo también sí. estoy perdiendo la señal. Sí, está un poquito baja. Ahora vamos a ver si está ahí. Pero se escucha bien, doctor. Sí. Pero Davinder, ¿está? No escucho retorno. Sí, yo tampoco. Davinder? Yes. Yes, yes. Ah, Davinder. All right. So we have uh, one more question of Gustavo that is in my right in photo. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so he, he has a question. Uh, in your goniotomy to fit uh, the canal with the proline, how much is your length of the goniotomy? Yeah. Gustavo, go, so good to hear your voice, my friend. Hope you're doing well. Hi, my friend. <laughs> thank uh, you very much uh, for the amazing presentation. Oh, thank uh, you. Cheers with Pisco. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'm enjoying it. Um, it's so good to hear old, old friends. Um, yeah, that's a great question. So. Um, I, I do, I try to make as large a goniotomy as possible. So probably about two to three clock hours to make a nice opening. So that allows you to get a bigger opening so that when you put the, uh, the 
it's easier to put the suture in. If you make a small opening, it's going to be very hard to sneak that suture in. But if you make a larger opening um, of at least two to three clock hours, then you can really see the back wall and it's easier to get it in there. Oh, perfect. Dr. Davinder, one question. Um, do you prefer, or when you do FACO, GAT, do you have any preferation like first GAT and then FACO or um, backwards? Yeah, so um, it's interesting. So this is what's fun, uh, as I talked about, when you know more and more people start doing all okay. these things, we learn more and more from everybody. And, um, and so at our GAT course, um, it's interesting, half of the faculty um, do, um, do FACO and then GAT, and the other mm -hmm. half of the faculty do, uh, do GAT and then, and, then, and then FACO. So uh, we've done everything when we first started doing it. Um, I like to do GAT first mm -hmm. because it gives you the best view. Um, and then I think that doing the FACO next and constantly irrigating out the eye and everything like that cleans out the system and um, and makes it less likely um, to have blood reflux. Okay. Um, but because I do know people do that do. And then GAT. And yeah, I do know people that do FACO and then GAT, um, mm -hmm. and um, and that I think is also a good option. Um, I would say early on, when you're first learning it. Um, it may be easier to do the GAT first because then you have the best view. Um, if you do FACO and then GAT and you, if you hydrate your wound a little bit or you get a little corneal edema, it can make your view in the angle a little bit more difficult. Um, and, um, and so it's sometimes, um, routinely what I do is, um, is for GAT and for goniotomy, I do GAT or goniotomy first and then FACO. Okay. For uh, for eye stents, I do afterwards um, because I think that small little opening can get easily clogged with lens material. So I want to clean it out, everything first, and then I do the eye stent. But with everything else, um, I do the I do the GAT first and then the FACO. Thank mm -hmm. you, Doctor. Okay. I think. Consuelo, ¿estás por ahí? Creo que querías hacer alguna pregunta. Hi, how are you, Davinder? How are you? You're in Miami, right? Yes, yeah, yes, doing well so far. <laughs> how are you doing? We're doing well. We're doing really well. Yeah. Perfect. So good to see you. I have a question because you know in Bascom Palmer all the people do trap and uh, tubes but not too many gas in patients with glaucoma. In your opinion, what, which is the best patient for doing a, a gut? A patient with pseudofiliation or a patient with, I don't know, uh, uh, which is the best scenario for you? Yeah. Um, a great, great question, Consuelo. Good to see you. Um, I, I think I think patients that have um, kind of all the secondary types, so mm -hmm. uh, pseudo exfoliation, pigmentary, uh, steroid induced, uh, uveitic that are controlled, uh, non granulomatous uveitics that are controlled. Um, the you know that you're seeing this avastin glaucoma patients that are getting all these Avastin injections and then their pressures start going up, 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 up. I think it's because uh -huh. the vehicle of the injection clogs up the meshwork. Those patients do really well. Any of my young patients, um, anybody that gets glaucoma in their teens, 20s, 30s, 40s, in my clinic, those are juvenile open angle glaucoma until proven otherwise. And so all those patients I, I would say do really well with GAT. Um, and, um, and anybody with kind of mild to moderate glaucoma, 
Um, but I think, it, you know, uh, I think it's the vast majority of patients that can do well. If it's a patient that has a 0.95 nerve and a constricted visual field and you need a pressure of 11, that's not a good candidate for GAP. Those are patients you need a TRAB in or, or, or maybe a tube, but a TRAB. But in, if, you can, if you need a pressure in the mid to, mid-teens, 15, on one drop, I think GAT will get you there. Um, if you need a pressure of 12 or 13 on two drops, I think GAT will get you there. Uh, if the patient can't tolerate a lot of drops or doesn't, you don't think they're going to use drops and mm-hmm. need a pressure in the low teens, uh, I don't think GAT will get you there by itself. GAT will get you to about unmedicated, about 16, 17, 18, something around the episcleral venous pressure without medications. And then you can use drops to get you down to 15 or 14. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for the tips. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There. <laughs> I, do, you I, still, do you still do in traps? Uh, I am, um, but it's less common because now um, what we do is, um, is if a patient fails GAT or I don't think they're a candidate for GAT, uh, then I actually will be doing um, a Zen in them. Ah, okay. Um, and then hopefully soon, you know, InFocus or Preserflow is approved in, um, in Canada and in Europe. Uh, hopefully it'll be approved in the United States in about a year. Um, but I'll, I now, I mean, I do a TRAB. It's very uncommon now. Maybe, uh, and I do maybe, you know, before all this craziness, I was doing probably 15 to 20 glaucoma surgeries a week. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would say maybe... Now I'm doing two to three trabs a year. Oh yeah. So it's really uncommon now. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Yeah, for me too. I, I don't do yep. it anymore. I have one more question. Uh, in the um, viewing the data, when you see the FACO combined with that, it has the best results. If I have a patient like in, in their forties, with no uh, cataracts, for example, what do you prefer, like doing the FACO GAT or just GAT or maybe another uh, surgery? Because we have like these patients with moderate glaucoma and we don't really know if we should uh, extract the lens, for example. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I think and if, if the patient's in their 40s or even mid to early 50s, uh, and they're phacic, um, I think uh, just doing a, a standalone GAT only is, is appropriate. Um, if a patient's in their 60s, um, then I would consider doing, um, doing a, a phaco GAT because then, you know, say the patient is 63 and they don't have a cataract or it's very mild, my worry is that the steroids as well as the, the sur- intraocular surgery will expedite the rate of cataract formation. And then maybe in the next six months or a year, they'll need cataract surgery. Um, so in those patients, I'd rather do both a combined FACO GAT because I think it's safer. And then I don't have to go back into the eye. But if they're 40 or 30 or even in 50s, I would do a standalone GAT and let them know that you know maybe your cataract may get worse and you will likely need cataract surgery before a lot of your friends. Um, but um, in that cases of standalone, you don't have like uh, pupil dilation after the surgery. Um, that? That's um, that's pretty uncommon. Um, the times that I see pupil dilation, prominent pupil, like long-standing pupil dilation or poorly dilated pupil, uh-huh. is. Um, is in patients who on the first day or two had a spike in pressure. Uh huh. Yes. I think they have some type of ischemic, I mean, talking like a spike of 30 or 40. Um, and um, those patients, I think, have some type of ischemic injury to the, uh, to the sphincter muscles as opposed to um, the trauma from the actual GAT itself. Um, so you can see that rarely if you have, if you leave too much viscoelastic in the eye or they get a big hyphema or they bleed afterwards, Some, sometimes you can get, um, you can get a spike in pressure. Um, but, uh, but now that we're being, 
smarter about leaving a little bit of helon in the eye, figuring out the wave. Uh, we're seeing um, we're seeing that less and less common, uh, but sometimes we still see that. Perfect. We have uh, one more question, Doctora Corina, está ahí. Yes, hello, how are you? I'm well, how are you? Hi. Fine, thank you. And uh, I just have a little question. It's, uh, for example, if you have um, uh, on, um, a closure angle and maybe you you want to be to, to do FACO first, after that, you what do you prefer? You, you could uh, to take to, uh, to do that? Yeah, so the, or, the question, or, you, or you prefer another procedure? Yeah, um, so um, the, um, the question is when you do GAT or you think about GAT and angle closure glaucoma, uh, I think first and foremost, the more, most important thing in, in angle closure glaucoma is to take out the lens. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, you know, what I do personally is I actually, in those patients, um, that's when I do a, um, a, a, a KDB or a goniotomy. Um, I'll take out the, uh, the lens, do a goniosneculysis, and then I'll treat a little bit of the angle. Now, uh, my partner, one of my partners, Dr. Tosin Smith, she does a lot of phaco gats in angle closure glaucoma. Um, but I would probably say take out the lens first. And, but unless you can, uh, I would say take out the lens first and then break all the sneakii and then do the gat. Even a hemi gat, I think, would be perfect. Um, sometimes in these angle closure eyes, if you just, if the attack is broken and you just put a helon in the eye and you push everything down, you can see the angle and, and you can do that first. So that would be my preference is I'd form the eye first. If I have space, then I would break the PIS, do the GAT or do the goniotomy and then do the FACO. If it's such a big lens and the angle is so small, uh, sometimes you don't have that option, then I would do the FACO first and then do maybe a hemigat or a goniotomy. Okay, okay, perfect. Okay, Is that in there? Yeah. Yes. Other question, uh, in a, in, image uh, a patient, young patient with a failure tooth angle, open angle glaucoma on the, with all the therapies like drops and metasolomide or acetosolomide, do you prefer put a second tube, a micropulse or a GAT in that case, for example? Um, after a failed tube? Yeah. So like a... Um, and a yeah. young patient with open angle glaucoma. Phakic or pseudophakic? Uh, sort of phakic. Okay. Um, so, and... When you say it's a failed tube, is it like an Ahmed valve that you think the valve is scarred down and there's no flow? Or do you think it's like a more of a bar valve where there's flow, but the pressure is still too high? The second scenario. Okay. With a bar valve. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in that first scenario, if the tube has failed and the, there's no bleb, that's a different situation than, yeah, um, than if you think there is flow and there's a nice bleb or capsule around the tube. Uh -huh or the pressure is too high. In that situation, if a patient is pseudophagic, then I like to do, um, um, then I like to do CPC diode. Mm -hmm. If they're pseudophagic, uh, mm -hmm. the traditional way, then you don't have to go into the eye. You can just do, um, you know, 1,000, 1,100, 1,200 milliwatts, 30, sec uh, 30 spots and 4,000 milliseconds. And, um, and you don't have to go into the eye if, they, if you know the tube is working. Because these tubes, when they fail, it's interesting. It's almost like a, uh, the, the capsule is so tight that yeah. it's not letting flow out. And you need to do something to just relax the capsule. And then it allows things to be permeable. So um, if they're pseudophagic, I would do a CPC diode. If they're phagic, I don't like to do a CPC diode because uh, I think it will definitely accelerate the rate of cataract formation. Um, okay. Now, there are people in, um, that are doing micropulse and in patients, 
and having good results and, and aren't getting a cataract formation. So I think you can consider micropulse in that situation. Um, in that situation, um, if they're young um, and they have a failed tube, I would do a GAT. I think GAT would be a reasonable option. Um, Perfect. And, and then like what uh, Juan Carlos was mentioning at the beginning is in those patients where you, you, know, you really think that they are sick and they have advanced glaucoma and they need as much as possible, then you could consider doing both a, a GAT and a micropulse. Perfect. But those eyes, are, those eyes are soon to be pseudophagic. You know, those, that, that eye is going to need a cataract surgery soon anyway. And the first scenario about uh, Ahmed Balt, it always happened, right? Like, yeah, yeah. Sometimes <laughs> you, yeah, you can yeah. see the, the, it just scar down. Those eyes I treat as if they don't have a tube at all. <laughs> so, yeah, so, uh, yeah. So those eyes, I will either just do a GAT uh, or a phaco GAT, um, or I'll put a um, a tube down below, inferior nasal. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you. So, any more questions? I think, I think we're okay, right? All right. Well, if there are any more, we can always talk about it next week, too. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Hey, Davinder, thank you very much for participating in these webinars. Uh, I'm sure that everyone enjoyed your, your participation, your presentation. Thank you very much, Davinder. Thank you, guys. Be safe. Thank you very much, Doc. Right. You're welcome. My pleasure. Thank you very much, Davinder. You're welcome. Good to see you guys, my friend. Be safe.